right, well, I can officially and actually say Merry Christmas. Yeah, Thanksgiving is over, which means now we can start all of the Christmas traditions and celebrations, which for our family means we can watch Christmas Vacation for the very first time this year, right? It is actually the greatest Christmas movie, hands down. I know some of you are like, well, what about It's a Wonderful Life? What about White Christmas? What about Charlie? Those are all great. They're just not as good as Clark W. Griswold bringing the Christmas cheer of a fun old-fashioned family Christmas. There's the Christmas traditions in our home of dragging out our fake pre-lit Costco done tree, which some of you who are maybe purists take issue with me in. Just, just give me a break. Look, we're trying to keep two kids alive. I don't want to have to worry about keeping a tree alive through the Christmas season. Are you with me? There's, there's Christmas traditions. And when it comes to Scripture Christmas traditions, the traditional text that we go to is usually Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story that's full of uh, Mary and Joseph and the, the shepherds and all of the story of the Magi and the manger and the nativity scene. And that's the typical traditional Christmas story that we go to. But this morning, I want us to start by going back a little further, even before the Luke 2 story. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1, where we're going to look at this story that kind of predates the Christmas story, the story that kind of helps us to understand a little bit of context, a little bit of what's going on, a little bit of what's been going on for many years before. So in Luke chapter 1, we catch up with the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Luke chapter 1, verse 5, says this, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. There's Zechariah and Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Pretty amazing. If you had a bio written about you, wouldn't you want this said about you? They were walking blamelessly with Jesus, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now, while Zechariah was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. We catch Zechariah in the middle of his work shift there working for the Lord. In verse 10, and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, troubled when he saw the angel, and fear fell upon him. This is no precious moments angel. This is no like cute little uh, white robe. This is like, uh, it really brings fear, sparks fear and trouble in Zechariah, verse 13. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you'll have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or dr strong drink. And he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he'll go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the dis disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years, which is, by the way, how you say something like that. It's okay for us guys to say, hey, I'm a really old man and she's advanced in years. That's the polite way to say what Zechariah says here. But there's so much power in this story and in this text. And it all hinges with Zechariah and Elizabeth in this season, in this moment of waiting. They've been waiting on God. 
And in this day when they've been waiting on God, they would have been looked down upon because they didn't have a child. They would have been looked down upon because they had not been able to have a child. But it's not because they didn't want a child. It's not because they hadn't been praying for a child. They'd been praying and asking God, would you please give us a child? But that prayer had not been answered in the affirmative. And now at the point that we catch up with them, they are old. They are advanced. And so you see that they're in this season of waiting. I I don't know about you, but maybe as we step into this Christmas season, you can relate to that. Maybe this morning on your way to church, you waited a little bit longer than you wanted to wait at the traffic light. But maybe it goes further and maybe it goes deeper for you than just waiting at a traffic light, waiting on a certain season to show up. Maybe you've been waiting your entire life for the hopes and the dreams that you've had personally that you've never experienced in your life or in your family. Maybe you've been waiting for a job to come through, sales to come back to the place that they were several years ago. Maybe you've been waiting for a sickness to go away. Maybe you've been waiting for a family member to be healed. Maybe you've been waiting on a relationship to come your way. Maybe you've been waiting for your marriage, the relationship that you've been in. Maybe you've been waiting for your marriage to get better, waiting for your kids to come back home, for your kids to come back to the faith. Maybe your whole life story can be summarized in, I've just been waiting for so long. As we unpack and as we dig around the Christmas story over this next month, I believe what we're going to find to be true is that the Christmas story is saturated in this idea of waiting on God. Now, let me just give you full disclosure. Let me just say from the outset, I don't like waiting. Maybe some of you are not wired like me. Maybe you're like, my spiritual gift is waiting. I I don't have to have Amazon Prime deliver between two and four o'clock. Today, I can wait several days. Maybe you're not like me. Maybe you love to wait, and that's just who you are and how you're wired. But I don't like to wait, and neither does our culture. Neither does our generation. We're kind of the microwave culture, aren't we? Like, when you go home today, go into your pantry and check your box of Pop-Tarts, which I know you have in your... Pantry, we're a microwave culture because there's microwave instructions on your Pop-Tart that says, take the Pop-Tart out of the package, place it on a plate and microwave for three seconds. Three seconds. We don't like to wait very long. We don't have a whole lot of time in our morning. We We got three whole seconds to make breakfast. We don't like to wait on making our lunch. And so we microwave our lunch that we pull out of the freezer. It's formed into a little pocket and tastes like pizza. Anybody else have pizza pockets in your freezer? Am I the only redneck around? Okay, I guess I'm the only one. There's, all right, y'all leave me hanging. We don't like to wait on our lunch to make it and cook it and prepare it, and so we'll pull it out of the freezer, throw it in the microwave, and eat it, but then we don't like to wait for it to even cool down, so we'll eat the pizza pockets and the hot pockets before they're even cooled off and burn our mouth so that everything tastes like rubber for a week. (laughs) But it's okay because we don't like to wait. We're a microwave culture, aren't we? It's kind of how we're wired. It's kind of how we operate. But one of the most powerful things that you and I can do in a season like this is understand what's happening in the waiting. In Luke chapter one, yes, Zachariah and Elizabeth are waiting. But as we start to journey into this Christmas season, I think it's important for us to know that Jesus came into a world that was in a season of great waiting. All you have to do is look at the very last book in the Old Testament, the the book of Malachi, this prophet who had a message from God for the people of God. The very last book is the book of Malachi. And the last book of the Old Testament closes. And you and I can take our Bibles, if you've got a physical copy of the Bible, maybe you're looking on your phone, maybe you're looking on the screen, maybe you're sharing with a friend, maybe you don't have any friends, and that would be me too. But you and I can easily and simply and quickly turn from the last page of the Old Testament to the next page over the first page of the New Testament. It's easy for us to do. It's quick for us to do. It's simple even to just flip a page. 
But it wasn't that easy in history. Because this period in between the last word from the Old Testament and the first word of the New Testament is what theologians refer to as the intertestamental period. This was a period in history, actual history, that represented 400 years. So while you and I can just flip a page from the Old Testament to the New Testament and see, oh yes, God made promises and God fulfilled promises. Well, we can flip a page and see that, yes, Jesus has shown up on the scene and done great things, just like God said he would. It wasn't that easy for people in history. There were 400 years in this intertestamental period of complete silence from God. There was no prophet of God. There were no preachers that God raised up to bring a message and bring a word from God to God's people. There was no cloud by day and fire by night. There was no presence of God in this moment. There was just silence. And so as you can imagine, there were probably a whole lot of questions. God, where are you? God, have you forgotten about us? God, what are you doing in this moment? Because all they heard was silence. Not silence for a minute, not silence for a year. No, God's people waited for 400 years. It's one thing to wait for a year. It's a whole different thing to wait for a decade, but a whole nother level to wait for a century, four centuries in fact. As you can imagine, hope begins to wane in the waiting, doesn't it? Because we think, well, okay, maybe tomorrow is going to be the day where we hear from God. Maybe next week is when God will come back and deliver on his promises. Well, after so many, maybe tomorrow is going to be the day, the enemy starts to have a playground in our mind and go, well, no, yesterday wasn't the day, and tomorrow is probably not going to be the day, and after 400 years of days, 146,000 days to be exact, there wasn't any forward progress on the promises of the Old Testament. But what was happening in those 400 years of silence in between the Old Testament and the New Testament? There's no extra pages. It's not like we can uh, find that, oh, there were pages stuck together here. No, there's no hidden cheat code Bible verses from those 400 years. But what we can't forget is that This story, our story, is anchored in history. This story really happened. It's a reality. It's not a fairy tale. So we can go back through the pages of history to find out what was happening in that time. In those 400 years of silence, there was a man named Alexander the Great. Perhaps you've heard of this guy, Alexander the Great. I think he gave himself the nickname because... Uh, Other people probably wouldn't based on how this guy acted. Alexander the Great is arguably to this day one of the brightest military minds in all of history. And yet, one of the most absolute worst humans on planet Earth. He was evil, narcissistic, brutal, in fact. Alexander the Great lived to be about 32 years old, and right before he died... He was conquering all of the known universe, and one of his last ideas was he wanted the entire universe to speak one language so that whenever Alexander the Great made a decision, so that whenever he wanted to get the word out, he didn't have to bank on someone translating it into another language so that they would understand what he wanted from them. You know, he just wanted to speak so that everyone would understand, and so Alexander the Great instituted a language which is known as Koine Greek. And without that language, this Bible that we hold in our hands right now, we most likely would not have it because the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. So as you think about, God, where are you? What were you doing in this silence? I don't understand what's going on. I can't see what you're doing. God's going, oh, hey, I'm orchestrating all of history And I'm raising up a guy so that when I send my son into the world, 
people will record the message of Jesus. And this message is going to go out into the world, and everybody is going to understand this message because I raised up a leader who instituted a common language. So in all of these 400 years of silence, as we wonder, God, where, where were you? We can't see you. We can't hear anything from you. What were you doing? God is working. God is orchestrating. He's using a guy who calls himself great, but who is far from great. And he's showing us, no, my son's about to come to planet Earth. And when he does, I am creating things in such a way so that everyone can understand who Jesus is. How beautiful is that? As we flip the page and go to these earliest accounts and stories of the New Testament. Luke and the very first people who get to hear a word from God are not Mary and Joseph, but a man named Zechariah. 400 years of silence culminates and ends with the angel of the Lord coming to Zechariah. Do you know what Zechariah's name means? His name means God remembers. 400 years of nothing from heaven as far as we know. And God shows up and sends the angel of the Lord to a man whose name means, hey, I know it's been 400 years, but I remember. His wife's name is Elizabeth. You know what Elizabeth means? God's promise, God's oath, God's covenant. Don't miss this. God is announcing to a couple whose name literally means God remembers God's promise. That's the expectation of Advent. That's the story of Christmas boiled down in a nutshell. God keeps his promises. He did in that day and he will in our day. He's never dropped the ball. God has never missed a call. He's never done something that he wished he could take back. He's never been so busy figuring out something else over here that he's forgotten what's going on over here with you. Never one time has God failed, and today won't be the day that he starts, and you won't be the person that he starts with. This is the hope of the Christmas season. And yet, at the end of the day, in our day, how do we find hope when it feels like Hope is nowhere to be found. What do we do when it feels like God's voice is silent in our life? What do you do when you get no return to phone calls on the job search? What do you do when you go on a first date but not a second date? When you graduate from college and you have to move back in with your parents? What do you do in those seasons when you face disappointment after disappointment after disappointment? What do you do when the diagnosis doesn't change? and you're waiting? What do you do when your circumstances don't get any better? What do you do when it feels like God is silent? When it feels like he's absent? When it feels like he doesn't even care anymore? What we do is we trust that his hands are active, that God's ability to work does not hinge on my perception of him working, that he is God almighty, that he paints on a bigger canvas than any of us can imagine. This is who he is. In this day, the people of God were waiting on a Messiah. In our day, we're waiting on the Messiah to return. And I believe we can learn a few things in this. Number one, what do we learn? What do we know in the waiting? Number one, we know that he's working in the waiting. We can see that all throughout history. God is raising up people like Alexander the Great, even when it seems like he's not working, even when he's silent, he's working in the waiting and raising up people like Alexander the Great. God uses anybody and everyone to accomplish his will. So while we're wondering what's going on, while we're asking the question, where's God? God, have you vanished? Are you even real? What we can see in the Christmas story is that God is working in the waiting, and he always is. I love this Old Testament text in Isaiah chapter 64, uh, where we see the prophet, long before Jesus ever showed up, say this, when you did awesome things that we didn't look for, 
You came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. Uh, Essentially, you did things that we didn't even realize and recognize. You were working in ways that we didn't even recognize. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No one has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. God acts on behalf of those who wait on him. While I wait, God works. Now, this isn't just some nice little Christian sentiment that is going to get you through a hard season. No, this is anchored in the unchanging word of God. It's a promise that you can count on. God promises that if you wait on me, I will work for you. Now, you may not see what God's doing. You may even be tempted to think God's not doing anything. But all the while, God is orchestrating things for his glory and for our good. He's working in our waiting. This doesn't mean your circumstances change in a minute. This doesn't mean you wake up tomorrow with a bed full of roses and pockets full of cash. It just means that while you wait, while you go home for Christmas once again this year and only have one seat on your flight reservation, while you wait another year that it's just you and your spouse and you had hoped that this year was going to be the year that a baby would come into the story, while you wait one more year without your dream job, while everyone else is living their dream, while you wait, he's working. And we all have waiting in different ways. And I don't want to belittle any of our waiting experiences, but I do want to encourage you that we have a promise-keeping God and that he's working while we're waiting and that he has infinite wisdom. God has all of the information that could ever be known. Scripture says that God is the Alpha and the Omega, which does not mean that he is pledged to a Christian fraternity, okay? He's... He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It means he stands at the end of all time and makes decisions about our time. That's what that means. You and I stand in the here and the now, and we have the information that we have, and we're like, God, why are you not doing anything about this? To which God would just remind us, oh, it's because you don't have all the information yet. There's a lot of things that you don't understand yet. And I'm navigating all of those pieces to make sure that what we do isn't fast, but it is right, and it is good, and it is noble. Lamentations chapter 3, we find God's people in the midst of a hard season, in the midst of a heavy season carrying things that humanity was never designed to carry. And in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 says this, the steadfast love of the Lord never, never ceases. The steadfast, always constant, always consistent love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Maybe you're in this season of waiting and you're just wondering where God is. God is still working and God is still good to you. We just have to understand that we are serving a God who is other than us. Not a better version of us, not a bigger version of you, a cleaner version of you. No, God's ways are higher than yours. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And this is what Isaiah says. So when you can't hear his voice speaking, trust that God's hands are working. He's working in our waiting. The second thing that I want us to realize in seasons of waiting is who we become while we wait is as important as what we're waiting for. I love this in the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Uh, As they're waiting and waiting and hoping and wishing, this is what scripture says of Zechariah and Elizabeth in Luke 1 verse 6, and they were both righteous before God. 
In other words, they didn't capsize their own ship. They didn't get out in front of their skis as they were waiting. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. We see Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Don't forget their story here. They're old. They're, they're advanced. When Jesus comes, when John the Baptist, their son, was born, but before any child was born, they were waiting on the heels of 400 years of silence. Far too often we remove ourselves from the stories of people in scripture because we think to ourselves, well, everything always worked out for them because they're in the Bible. They were here as if what happened to them can't happen to us. But I've never gotten the memo that what God did in scripture, God can't do in our own life. We, we tend to think, well, they didn't suffer like we do. They, they don't wait on things like we do. But they were part of the waiting too. And all throughout their waiting, they were becoming something. What were they becoming? They were becoming righteous in the sight of God, observing everything that God commanded blamelessly. Even when they looked out on the horizon even when they didn't hear a word from God, even when they continued to experience heartbreak and pain, they were becoming something, which means, translation, you can become something while you wait. God might be preparing you for what's next, and he wants to do something in your waiting. So in your waiting, can I just encourage you to anchor yourself in community? Don't wait alone connect, belong, anchor yourself in a community that will fight for God's promises in your life when you want to bail. Get people around you that can call the enemy a liar when you're not sure that the enemy's lying to you. Get people in your crew that'll fill up the silence when you feel like you're too tired to put anything in to the silence. Okay, now enemy, you not, you don't not only have to go through me, but you've got all of these six other people to take out before you can get to me. Good luck with that. Find some community that'll reinforce your trust in God Almighty. The last thing, let's put a bow on this. Number three, while we wait on God, we wait with God. This is the essence of what Christmas is all about. It's this word, Emmanuel, which if you break it down, Emmanuel, uh, means with us. El is the word for God. Literally translated, Emmanuel is the with us God. And so while God doesn't always offer answers in our circumstances, he always offers his presence. So you've got to understand that while we wait on God, we wait with God. This is the power of Emmanuel. In Matthew's gospel, he shows us that this was the plan all along. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 22, it says this, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Everything God promised led to this. What is this? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Charles Spurgeon about this text says the name Emmanuel is eternity's sonnet. It's heaven's hallelujah. It's the shout of the glorified and the song of the redeemed. The chorus of angels, that's what it is. John Wesley, the last words that John Wesley ever spoke before he died said, the best of all is that God is with us. The power of this is enough to anchor you no matter how long your season of waiting has been. Because the enemy's primary way to get us to throw in the towel is to convince us that God is not working. Or worse, that God isn't real. Or that you're by yourself. The enemy had a slogan on repeat for us. The soundtrack that some of us listen to in our minds is that you're by yourself. You're all alone. You're isolated. But that's not true for those of us who've put our hope in Jesus. 
Because Jesus says, my name is the with us God. Matthew 1 begins with the story that says, they will call his name Emmanuel. The long-awaited arrival of King Jesus, God with us. But you know what the very last verse in Matthew chapter 28 says? It says this, I will be with you even until the end of the age. The bookends of the gospel of Matthew, the account of Jesus, the Messiah arriving on planet earth, begins and ends with a simple statement. I am with you in the waiting when you can see me and when you can't. I am with you when you're aware of what I'm doing and when you're not. I am with you when your tank is full. I am with you when you're running out of gas. I am almighty God. I am the with you God. That's who I am. That's the Christmas story. And yet for many of us today, we're at that place where we're almost just shooting up a flare gun at heaven saying, Jesus, can you even see me anymore? Because it's been let down after let down. It's been waiting after waiting after waiting. Jesus, can you even see us anymore? And yet, before Jesus showed up, the prophet Isaiah said this in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, as he's speaking on behalf of God to the people of God, making promises uh, from our promise-making God. This is what God says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This may have been a hard year for you. It's been a hard year for many. But maybe you're wondering, how long can I keep going? I can't see God and what he's doing. I don't know if God is doing anything. But today, we don't have to see what God's doing to be able to trust that he's moving. He has never failed and won't start now. It may be completely foggy for you. You may not be able to see how God could work out his promises in your life. But you say, I know God. I know he's a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. So I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. I'm going to take one step and then the next step. I'm waiting on God because those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. That's the promise from Almighty God. You and I are not going to get strong by bailing out and trying to come up with some quick scheme to fix everything in our life. You're going to get strong by waiting on God who has all the information, who sees from beginning to end, to go, no, 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 no. May not be fast, but God will make it right. We're gonna wait because this is how God gets the glory and how he works for my good. This is our king. So in this Christmas season, church, may we wait well. As Advent starts and as we roll into this season, let's not believe the lie that we're all alone, that we're all by ourselves. Let's focus on what's true, that we have a promise-making and a promise-keeping God who is with us in our waiting. Let's pray. Jesus, we're grateful for a season that comes around every single year where we're reminded that in the waiting you're working, where we're reminded that you're doing something in us just as much as you're doing stuff through us. And that wherever we're at, whatever we're walking through, wherever we've been and wherever we're headed, you are with us because that's who you are. 
you are the with us God, Emmanuel. In Jesus' name, amen.